I hope you can see my screen. Great. Yeah, okay. So thank you for having me, first of all, and I'm very happy to be here in these seminars. And today I'm gonna talk to you about how I'm studying the shark embryo to understand the origin and evolution of cell types. First of all, I would like to start by using an analogy that has been used before by Paul Sisek or Maria Toskes, but I think it illustrates very well on why we need to study evolution to really truly understand the brain. And this is because brains are not engineered machines. Brains are the product of an evolutionary process. And understanding this evolution is important because the way evolution, the way biological systems are constructed is very different to the way human engineers um, build artificial systems. So human engineers define the challenge and design mechanisms to solve it. But uh, evolution does not identify challenges at all. What evolution does is to modify developmental programs of individuals within populations and favors those variations that accomplish something. So, and these variations are always built in pre-existing structures. So if we want to know how or why the brain is the way it is, why it's built the way it is, we need to reconstruct how it has evolved. And what do I mean by reconstructing how it has evolved? Well, what I need, what I mean, sorry about this, yeah. What I mean is simply to follow this line of ancestry and discover the sequence of events that led to the formation of the different brains. Um, but how do we do this? If we don't have access to the brains of our ancestors, what we typically do is to take uh, species that live nowadays and compare species that survive until today and from their commonalities and differences, try to infer how our common ancestors might have been. And what do we know so far? So we know that first neurons appear somewhere here, first bilaterian brains appear somewhere there, first vertebrate brains. And for you to get an, a sense of where we are, this is the mammalian radiation. Most of what you know nowadays of how our brains evolve come from a handful of species, and often these species are mammalian species. Uh, that means um, all these animal groups here, fish, amphibians, reptiles, are terribly understudied. And this means that we are part practically blind to all the events that happened here. So to all the events that, um, to all the early events of vertebrate brain evolution. Um, as I said before, evolution acts on developmental programs and development is, it tends to be quite conserved across the species, which makes comparisons much easier. So I would argue that both the study of evolution and development are key to understand the brain. And myself, I am studying the development of um, the brain of a shark to understand the early evolution of vertebrate brains. And in particular, in this project, I'm studying the telencephalon, which is this purple part here, which in humans uh, gives rise to the cerebral cortex, neocortex, basal ganglia, etc. So this is the species I am studying. It's uh, the cat shark called Silorinus canicula. Uh, it lays eggs. This, these eggs are transparent and they are available all year long across, across all European coasts. Also, you can culture the embryos outside their egg cases, as you can see hopefully here, which is very um, handy to, to do many experimentation on them. And it also has a good quality genome that has been recently sequenced from the Sanger Institute. So this is a very good species to study development. And why are sharks interesting? Well, sharks, I think, are interesting for many reasons, but I will give you one. Uh, and they occupy these key phylogenetic positions. They are the descendants of a very ancient lineage of vertebrates whose common ancestor with us sits here at a very interesting transition in vertebrate evolution. And this transition is the acquisition of jaws when um, predatory behavior appeared. And with predatory behavior, mostly like the complexification of the brain happened. And it's possible that uh, this came with the appearance of a complex telencephalon and the appearance of many innovations as well in development and in the telencephalons in general. We just don't really know because the only way to study this transition is by studying more than cartilaginous fish. So cartilaginous fish, sharks, cates, and chimeras have been living in the oceans uh, in, in this family of fish over 400 million years ago. This is even before the first trees appear on land. And uh, their life cycles are very long and slow. All of this argues for slow evolution. 
This means that they might have retained ancient features of the common ancestor that other vertebrate lineage might have secondarily lost. And if you need more reasons why sharks are important, we should study more sharks. Um, this is a question I get a lot. Why don't you choose bony fish? Why don't you choose zebra fish with all the tools available or medaka? Well, one reason is because sharks did not undergo an extra genome, whole genome duplication as bony fish did. This means that orthology is one-to-one -one when you compare sharks and mammals, for example. And also the telencephalons of bony fish are extremely divergent. They develop by inversions instead of evagination, which is the way um, all other tetrapods develop and also cartilaginous fish. And this makes comparisons of the several fish with other vertebrates very difficult, especially in the telencephalon. Right, so how I'm studying uh, the sharks. My initial approach is based on single cell transcriptomics. Basically, I sequence the single cells of the telencephalon of the shark, characterize them, and then I try to compare with other vertebrates to infer evolutionary changes. And some of the biological questions I want to address are what developmental cell types do we share with sharks? What innovations likely appear in the common ancestor of short vertebrates? And how much have these cell types changed throughout evolution from sharks to mammals? So uh, we generated for this single cell data set. Um, we took three independent samples of dissected telencephalons at stages of development that would be equivalent to mouse embryonic day 12 to 14. So this means a neurogenesis stages. And we generate in 21,000 uh, nuclear transcriptomes. And I'm going to show you a little bit of the characterization of this data set. First of all, we have some non-neuronal clusters on this side, and most of them are neurons because we uh, actually dissected the brain. Makes sense. On the non-neuronal side, we have meningeal and choroid plexus, some astrocytes and blood and vasculature. And on the neuronal side, one thing we did was to first look at the cell state scoring. This means what I'm showing you here is all the cells that you see in yellow score very high for apical progenitors or early progenitor signature. This is score higher for secondary progenitors, early neurons and late neurons. So I hope you appreciate, I'm gonna play that again, that from early uh, progenitors, secondary progenitors, early neurons and late neurons, there is some, some sort of trajectory here. So what we saw is that uh, there is an axis of differentiation from left to right. So that was pretty clear. But we also know, and we saw that here, uh, there are two branches, right? And we know that in the telencephalon, we have one half called the pallium that produces glutamatergic neurons and the other half called surpallium that produces GABAergic neurons. And similar approaches led us to uh, conclude that we have here a surpallial lineage of GABAergic neurons and a pallial lineage. So we have a very, very nice data set to reconstruct developmental progression uh, in the both main lineages of the telencephalon. And we also generated a spatial transcriptomic data sets um, with a Bayesian technology in this case, in which we have uh, several transverse sections. In this case, uh, I'm showing them stained with uh, metoxylin and niacin. And you put these sections uh, on top of a grid of dots that capture RNA, and each of the dots label RNA with a unique spatial barcode. This is, of course, not single cell resolved, as you can see, but the power of it relies on the fact that we have access to the whole transcriptome. So we could project on this grid expression of any gene in the transcriptome. And this becomes even more powerful when you combine it with our single cell uh, data set, which is in the same uh, developmental stage of this one. And that is what we did. Uh, I don't intend you to see the details on this slide. I just want to illustrate that we are linking the spatial expression with the single nucleus expression to generate an atlas, um, a more complete atlas. And this uh, is already showing some good insights, like uh, we found where the olfactory bulb, pallial and subpallial amygdala are, or septal regions, also LG and MG trajectories for maybe telencephalon aficionados in the audience. And I, I wish I had more time to uh, talk about many details of what we've uh, discovered in this, in this atlas, but for the sake of time today, I will conclude uh, with a very interesting lead that we are following right now. And this is about this tiny population here. So at the beginning, we didn't know what it was, but it had one of the most unique transcriptome profiles of the whole data set. 
When we look for enrichment of genes, these three top genes pop up. And this happened to be the molecular signature of Cajal red cells. cell. Um, for those of you that might never heard of Cajal red cells, cells, this is a very interesting uh, cell type. It's present is currently reported in amniotes only so far, and their function is really only known in mammals. So in mammals, uh, they have a key function in the development of the neocortex with a main role in the control of cortical layering, cortical lamination. So they are born here at the border of the palina subpalin, and they migrate to layer one from where they signal to the other neurons, and uh, they are very important for layering between other things. But their presence in the shark is really intriguing. So sharks don't have a neocortex. Uh, this argues as well for a very ancient origin of this cell type. And this is opening new avenues of study to, to, to investigate the evolutionary origin of this cell type using the shark. Uh, but one important thing to, to keep studying about this is whether this is actually an homologous cell type or not. This is not a trivial question and very difficult to answer. Uh, but one way to answer this in a more unbiased way, not just by the expression of uh, three genes, is by uh, doing integration with other data sets from other animals in which the Cajal red cells have been characterized. And that's exactly what I did. So I took a uh, few data sets from the mouse from similar stage in which Cajal red cells are clearly labeled. And I also took a data set from uh, the salamander from the Tosquets lab which is from very similar stages, also has two branches from the pallion and the subpallion. The original publication, uh, they did never mention the existence of Cajal red seals, but in my, in my hands, when I replotted this data, something popped up that looked extremely similar to it. So what I did is to now integrate these three data sets with different methods and unbiasedly ask whether they find each other comparing the whole transcriptome, not just the few genes. And as I said, we did this in several methods, but I'm showing here the sum up methods, thanks to Nico for uh, running all this for me. And what we saw here is that uh, the only um, cell types, so I'm going to explain this before, um, before going to detail. So this is the cell types of the mouse data set, the cell types of the shark, and the cell types of the salamander. The only cell type that find a one-to-one -one correlation across the three species is actually the Cajal red sea cell. And this evidence strongly argues for common ancestry of this cell type and, and deep conservation. And this common ancestry probably dates back at least to the common ancestor of all jawed birds. So to summarize, uh, we have created a single cell resolution atlas for the gene expression in developing shark encephalon, both spatial and single nucleus. And our data strongly suggests that Cajal red sea cells are not an amniote innovation, but that probably descendants of an evolutionary ancient type that trace back to the common ancestor of all uh, vertebrates with jaws. So it's possible that these cell types actually appear at the same time or coincident with this complexification of the brain when predatory behavior appears, for example. And what will be very exciting now is to explore where are they, because we still haven't found them, and we are doing HCR probes and in situ to, to find them. What is their function in animals without a neocortex? How much they have changed from shark to mammals? And also, can we test evolutionary hypothesis in the shark model? So these are very ambitious questions that, of course, I will not have time to, to finish during my postdoc, but I hope to bring to my future group, and I have it, um, so, but to answer this and other questions, it will be great to have functional tools. And for that, we are already optimizing injection and electroporation of constructs um, with the hope to report expression of some genes and try to modify gene expression in the shark. And it would be very exciting, for example, to first identify a gene or a signaling pathway that we believe responsible for some sort of phenotypic change and knock it in, in the shark and see if we mimic evolution, right? And so far in our pilot experiments, we are actually observing some striking changes. Uh, some of them even look like potential folding phenotypes, but these are things that we are currently investigating. It's still early days for, for these experiments, but certainly promising times for the future of shark research. 
And with this, I would like to thank you all for your attention, for being here today, and the Arendt Group in particular for being a great place uh, to do research and for supporting me always. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Adaya, for a really exciting seminar. Uh, we already have a question from Frederick Cassere. Hi, fantastic data. He has two questions, actually, about your Cajal mm -hmm. Reptius data. Do you know the position of Cajal Reptius cells in the shark brain, and are they transient? Yeah, we don't know. Uh, as I said, I think at the at the at the end, maybe he asked this uh, earlier. Uh, we don't know because the um, spatial transcriptomics data set we have, the resolution is not single cell, so we don't see them. And we see in the data set, uh, they are a very, not very abundant cell type. So um, it's a mystery for me still where they are, but we are doing uh, probes to to look for them uh, with with stainings in the tissue. So hopefully soon we will know. Great. Um, and Kai Boon Tan also has a question about the Kahal Retia cells. Captivating talk. Do you have a clue about the origin of these cells in the shark? They seem to cluster with GABAergic lineages. Are they indeed generated from the shark subpalium? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And actually, they are glutamatergic, but in the UMAP, they are attached to the GABAergic um, branch. But that GABAergic branch at the end is actually a mix, it's, it's, it's kind of a gluta-GABA mix area where the amygdala is, where the septum is. So um, they are indeed glutamatergic, not GABAergic. So when you look at, at the GABA expression, it's, it's not there. And yes, my guess is uh, there, by their position, there is some somewhere mixing between pallion and subpallion, which fits with what we know in the in the mammals as well, that they are born at the interface of the paleosopalium during the paleosopalium boundary. Um, but that's all, I, all we know so far. They're definitely not covered. So John Mooley has a question, a technical question. Do you find any issues using single cell pipelines for marine species? Uh, we didn't actually. So I was lucky that when I arrived in the lab, uh, there was some very good protocols for single nucleus extraction. So that's what I've tried in the shark so far, not single cell. And, and mainly from the Kessman uh, lab, uh, the protocols in the shark work first time, uh, absolutely amazingly. So no problems with, with anything in particular, we just okay. replicated what you do. Great, and we have time for just a couple more questions. Uh, Dan, uh, we have a question, fantastic talk. Do you think CR cells would be seen in extant non-jawed vertebrates? <laughs> Great question. I don't know. That's the the an excellent question again. So we should look at the lamprey. We should look at Amphioxus and see if we see something else there that looks like it. But chances are, I mean, uh, at least uh, the conservation I see from from sharks to mammals is really striking. Whether they appear in sharks or in or before can be only answered by looking at the lamprey or, or even before that. And regarding the, the Calretia cells, are the gene modules evolving faster than the, an actual cell phenotype? And is this observed for other cell types? The gene modules evolving faster. Um, I'm not sure if I get the question, um, but I have to say we have not yet looked in detail at the, at the gene regulatory networks. Um, the genes themselves look quite similar, the um, gene modules. Not so sure what do you mean. And, and I'm sure that you would be happy to answer additional questions uh, um, in the chat or in the sure. Q&A. I'm gonna, um, for one more final question, if you can answer quickly, could similar analysis of lamprey as outgroup bring some insights? Absolutely. I think uh, there is a very nice paper also from the Kessman lab that it's an adult lamprey, uh, as far as I know. So I think um, developing lamprey would, would illuminate many questions as well, of whether all these cell types are emerged at the shark uh, lineage or before that. So, yeah, very okay. important. Thank you so much for an um, uh, exciting seminar. And we're gonna move on now to our final talk.